Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Elizabeth Whitehouse. I'm the Director of Education and Workforce Development at the Council of State Governments in Lexington, Kentucky at our headquarters. And I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. I want to welcome you to the CSG eCademy webinar exploring what the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act means for state leaders. As states grapple with the upcoming changes to federal requirements, it's important to know about the increased flexibility for states and local policymakers in the Every Student Succeeds Act. We'll cover what this means for states on the topics of accountability systems and data use. We've got a great lineup of speakers paying close attention to these issues. Here's our lineup. First, we're going to hear from Dr. Lou Young, Director of Next Generation Education Partners at the University of Kentucky and an advisor at the National Center on Innovation in Education who will tell us what the Every Student Succeeds Act is and what new flexibility it provides and what it means for states in regards to accountability and working with local districts. Then we'll hand it off to Gretchen Guppy, Policy Director at ACT, covering what states are currently doing in accountability and the opportunities that the Every Student Succeeds Act provides in this area of policy and practice. And our last speaker is Brennan McMahon-Parton, Associate Director of State Policy and Advocacy at the Data Quality Campaign, and she will address what the Every Student Succeeds Act means for state, states in regards to data policy and accountability, and what state trends she's seeing in data collection use, and how that uh, looks through the lens of accountability measures. If at any point during the webinar you have a question for one of our presenters, you may enter it into the GoToWebinar interface, and we'll ask as many as we can at the end of today's event. So let's dive right in. Dr. Young, I know you have a unique perspective as a former superintendent, and I know that, that what you have to say is really interesting to our members. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm really looking forward to this conversation, and I appreciate the opportunity to actually share my nascent understanding of the Every Student Succeeds Act. It was a good opportunity for me to um, actually delve into the act and look at some 10,000 foot level um, uh, takeaways from how where the act is and what it currently shows us. So if you'll go to that first slide, just a bit of a primer. Um, the Every Student Succeeds Act is the new name of the reauthorized Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And this law is the one that funds elementary and secondary education at the federal level. The original Elementary and Secondary Education Act dates all the way back to the Johnson administration in 1965 and established the U.S. Department of Education, Title I, Title II, etc. ESSA, I'll use that um, acronym for right now, uh, replaces No Child Left Behind. And it also um, takes full effect in the 2017-18 school year. Just as a quick reminder before we go to the next slide too, No Child Left Behind as it began to wane was replaced by a period of No Child Left Behind waivers. So uh, my state, Kentucky, for example, was in that second batch of No Child Left Behind waiver approval. So it was a bit of a, a limbo there um, when some regulatory changes happened in the, absent of the absence of the reauthorized law. Some key elements of the law, I tried to put this in a perspective that would be helpful to the uh, audience that would be listening to this webinar today and weighing in. So one of the key ones that I feel like I, we, I feel most prepared to talk to you about is the issue of state level accountability. And under ESSA, states are now required to devise their own accountability systems, still submit them to the U.S. Department of Ed for approval, but um, Having been a former superintendent, as Elizabeth mentioned, and still being very active in the American Association of School Administrators, uh, I would say that the big takeaway there, the big implication is that um, superintendents and school leaders see ESSA as a significant improvement over No Child Left Behind and the No Child Left Behind waiver period in that it does return a lot of autonomy and flexibility to states and districts. So we'll explore that some in the next few minutes in the webinar. Um, under accountability requirements under ESSA, states must still set goals aiming to close achievement and graduation gaps. Um, that's been common vernacular throughout the No Child Left Behind and the No Child Left Behind waiver era. States must also measure academic achievement, graduation rates, English language proficiency, and non-academic indicators. 
So I have a slide, a couple slides coming up that will explain that in a little bit more detail, but I'll try not to take you too much into the weeds in terms of what the assist, uh, accountability system entails. Again, implications for states and districts is that um, most of us are feeling uh, like we're taking a deep breath and having a chance to kind of recalibrate and get um, large-scale, high-stakes accountability uh, back in line with what we're, work, what we're doing in states and districts. And so we see this as um, a bit of a reprieve and a time to recalibrate and get things right. And I'll be happy to answer more questions about that one a little bit later on. So under accountability, it's broken into two subsets based on grade level. The first, in terms of elementary and middle, uh, middle school, the accountability system must include annual, annual proficiency assessment, um, and I'll break those down for you in just a minute, but as under No Child Left Behind, that includes annual testing in English language arts and math in grades three through eight. It allows for academic growth on an annual assessments if the state determines that to be the appropriate academic indicator. Notice the big or in the middle of that bullet. States may choose another academic indicator other than growth if they choose to do so. In Kentucky, again, talking about my state, we uh, currently assess in um, under academics in achievement and growth. So that's something that everyone in Kentucky is a buzz about to determine whether or not growth measures will remain. Many states have some kind of a growth measure. In fact, ours in Kentucky is modeled after um, the Colorado growth model, for example. Um, elementary and middle school accountability must include progress in achieving English language proficiency. And then notice the second one is another optional one. They, it must include another indicator of school quality or success, but it's left up to the state to determine that. So while we have had many measures like these in the current accountability, notice that two of the four bullets are to be determined at the state level, another example of the flexibility that's been returned under ESSA. At the high school level, on this next slide, you'll see that it's similar in some cases, proficiency on annual assessments, I'll break those down for you, academic growth, if the state has determined that to be an appropriate academic measure. High schools must include the four-year graduation rate and, at the state's discretion, the five-year graduation rate. In Kentucky, we pushed hard to keep five-year reporting in the system because we have a lot of students that take an additional year in high school, and frankly, we don't want to ever give up on them. We believe that a fifth-year graduate is still a high school graduate and that, in fact, that high school diploma will change her trajectory into the future. So. Um, so school folks feel very strongly about wanting to be able to continue to report five-year um, cohorts in graduation. High schools are also required to report progress in achieving English language proficiency for those um, English language learners in our systems. And then again, at least one indicator of school quality or success as determined by the state. Um, there's no mandate that the um, other indicator would be the same at high school as it is at elementary and middle. A lot of conversation about what that other indicator could include, and folks have talked about things like student engagement, educator engagement, student access to advanced coursework like dual credit, climate and safety, um, even um, attendance has been uh, talked about a little bit in terms of what that other indicator could be. So a lot of um, ideas coming to bear about what that might entail. Next slide, please. Now, from accountability, remember that accountability is the large system that's run at the state level, and it entails a variety of different measures and indicators, most of which are derived from testing. So more specifically in testing, under ESSA, student, all states must test students in reading and math in grades three through eight, and notice at least once in high school, um, what those tests are, of course, are left up to individual states. In science, students must be tested once each year over a grade span. So once in somewhere in grades three through five, at some point in grades six through nine, and at some point in grades 10 through 12 in science. And those are the only content areas that are specifically mentioned in ESSA. Um, 
excluding, for example, um, writing as a separate test um, that we have done in Kentucky for years under No Child Left Behind and in most states. States must also test students um, in order to provide data for whole school as well as subgroups of students. Um, and we've talked a lot about achievement gaps and student subpopulations since the advent of No Child Left Behind. And so this includes students um, who are um, African American, students of Asian descent, uh, students who are of poverty, usually defined as eligible for free and or re reduced lunch, students with disabilities, and um, uh, I'm forgetting something. Oh, and then um, we have also disaggregate by gender, male and female. So that um, requirement to disaggregate the data for students by subpopulation remains, and also uh, a remnant from No Child Left Behind states must test 95% of students each year to have met the compliance requirements of the law. So just a brief comment about implications again. One of the things I think you'll notice off the bat is that there's been quite an outcry in the last, last decade about too much testing. You'll see that this is actually a reduced amount of required testing. Remember, this is the minimum. States can exceed the minimum federal requirement. Um, on a personal note, I'm hoping that that doesn't happen, that we will not um, find ourselves making this more complicated than ever before. Because one of the implications, in my opinion, for districts is that ESSA provides for a simpler, more straightforward, less convoluted approach to accountability than what we've experienced in the past. Next slide, please. There's a lot of conversation about standards and how they fell out in um, ESSA. And of course, I know that in all of your states, you've had many conversations positive and negative around the issue of the Common Core. Um, interestingly enough, ESSA uh, does require all states to adopt challenging academic standards, yet it is emphatically clear that um, those standards will be left entirely up to state and local school leaders. So, uh, in fact, the U.S. Secretary of Education is prohibited under ESSA from forcing or encouraging states to pick a particular set of standards. And I'll be happy to say more about that if you have questions in that regard. I looked up the language where that was concerned because I found that to be so fascinating from a political standpoint. And in fact, it says that uh, in the law it prohibits any agent of the federal government, including the Secretary of Education, from incentivizing, forcing, or coercing states into adopting Common Core or interfering with the state standards or assessments. And then secondly, it rejects policies and programs the Secretary has used to coerce states to adopt Common Core, including waivers of K-12 education law and race to the top. So pretty strong, clear statements there regarding standards. Next slide, please. The law does still require states and local districts to um, meaningfully differentiate among all schools, those that are the lowest performing. So under No Child Left Behind, the bottom 5% of schools, of Title I schools, were referred to as priority schools, originally persistently low achieving, and then uh, under No Child Left Behind, that name was changed, that title was changed to um, priority schools. So ESSA does require a methodology for states to identify which schools those are. It also specifically targets high schools where graduation rates are less than 67%, 67% or less. And it requires states to identify those schools where subgroups of students are consistently underperforming. So in Kentucky, that's often students of poverty um, and students with disabilities, just for example. But the disaggregation will provide for that. And under No Child Left Behind, those were called focus schools and a requirement to differentiate those schools accordingly does remain in ESSA. Next slide, please. Because we're in a bit of a limbo, uh, because remember ESSA goes into full effect in 2017 and 18, um, the law does provide for a transition period that requires this ident the current identification process to continue through, um, through the 2016-17 school year and then ESSA identification in what's called the state accountability workbooks must kick in in 2017-18. So there, 
would be no period of time when schools, low performing schools were not identified, held accountable for their performance, and then special supports put in place. Um, so I think they're providing for the transition that way. Notice too that um, the low performing schools status, those three different markers must, um, that determination must be made at least every three years. And in order to fund that, this is slightly different, probably a little too granular for you, but this is um, that states are required to set aside 7% of their Title I funds to provide special support for school improvement in these identified schools and even districts that might be low achieving. So implications for states and district here, um, I think that one of the things I would say to constituents is that um, nobody is off the hook for low performing schools um, at this period of transition, um, that that provision does take place. And I hope that we will find ourselves in a position where um, we have both high stakes, middle stakes, and even low stakes in this um, new design of accountability so that we are all really looking at the lowest performing schools with the lens of how can we provide the assistance that we need to turn those schools around. So much more um, carrot and much less stick I think is the implication for the potential um, as the new accountability workbooks roll out across states. Almost finished, but a couple more slides. Um, these again are getting a little bit specific. Um, English learners, and for those of you who are in more rural states like Kentucky, um, you'll know that that is a growing population, but it, has, it causes um, um, significant challenge at the school level oftentimes because we're always looking for those best practices that help our English language learners become more proficient in a more speedy way. Um, under the ESSA, the new law moves accountability for English learners from what was Title III into the large Title I um, allocation with special provisions under Title I. And notice that the English learners test scores will be phased in for accountability purposes over their first three years in U.S. schools. So a lot of conversation going on about how much time it takes for a young person, especially if they're um, an older student, an adolescent, for example, uh, learning English takes more time than it does for their younger siblings who are five, six, and seven years old, for example. So it does provide for a phase in there. Next slide, please. For teachers, a lot of national conversation around the requirement under the No Child Left Behind waiver. This was under the waiver that um, teachers be required, that teacher evaluation be tied to accountability. That has been eliminated, as well as the No Child Left Behind notion of highly qualified teacher requirements. Um, now, don't misinterpret that to say that ESSA doesn't require teachers to be highly qualified. It just takes away a federal definition of highly qualified that was often unwieldy and mis, uh, misunderstood. As I mentioned, the No Child Left Behind waiver required teacher evaluation tied to student outcomes as a part of state assessment and accountability. That has been eliminated. And then notice in terms of implications, as I've mentioned earlier, another example is where states and districts have more discretion on the best ways to support educator improvement um, in terms of quality and equity. So school administrators are happy dancing around that um, increased discretion at the local and state level. Next slide, please. So the transition provides for all waivers. Kentucky and many states, I can't remember the number example, exactly, but it's more than 40, have a no child left behind waivers. Those are null and void this August 1st. But as I mentioned, Nobody's off the hook for supporting low performing schools and schools with big achievement gaps, focus schools as I mentioned, until their actual new ESSA accountability plans kick in. And we do expect regulation on ESSA in November of 16, this fall. So and when those uh, regulations roll out um, for state education agencies, we'll see a whole lot of quick turnaround work that happens, I'd say from November until the end of the 16, 17 school year with a, hopefully a lot of public input as those new workbooks um, develop. Here in Kentucky, we have a new commissioner of education, Dr. Stephen Pruitt, and he has been, uh, just as an example, on a statewide listening tour where he has conducted town hall meetings um, in virtually every corner of Kentucky asking folks 
what they want from their schools and what they would expect of state assessment and accountability. So it's been a very timely um, implementation uh, of feedback and voice from across the state here in Kentucky as an example. Next slide, please. I just have a couple more uh, for those of you who might be more interested in federal program changes and just a couple of discrete items here on the two slides. And I believe I've misspelled block. I found this later as a BLOC. I apologize for that. But under ESSA, it did provide a new $1.6 billion block grant, which would allow for a consolidation of several federal programs uh, oversight, including some uh, physical education, programming, advanced placement, school counseling, and ed technology that have been administered as separate funded grants at the federal level, just as an example. And a lot of folks have questions about early childhood education, and the, there, it does establish a preschool development grant, but shifts that to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, but notice that it is still to be jointly administered by the U.S. Department of Ed. So an example of one of those kind of cross departmental programs, but in my opinion that makes a lot of sense to have both health and human services and um, education involved in early childhood and preschool development. And last slide for now. Um, this It also creates a new evidence-based um, research and innovation program. Uh, under No Child Left Behind, the feds administered a, a grant program called I3, which stood for Investing in Innovation. This does provide for continued emphasis on research and innovation um, in a new series of grants. And then lastly, uh, it creates a pilot project which will allow 50 districts to try out a weighted student funding formula. Um, having been Chief Academic Officer in Lexington, Kentucky, Fayette County Schools, I was really excited about this potential because it really encourages 50, I would imagine, large districts to try out a combination of state, local, and federal funds targeted to better serving low-income students and students with disabilities. So I really appreciate seeing the innovation uh, potential in the grant as well. And Elizabeth, Elizabeth, I believe that's my last slide, and I think we're going to be holding questions perhaps till later if that's how you want to handle it. And thanks, everybody, for the chance just to share that with you. Sure. No, Lou, thank you so much. Uh, and please, please stay with us, and I bet we will have some questions for you. Um, but if you do have a question for Lou or for any of our presenters, you can enter it in the GoToWebinar interface at any time. And at the end of the program, we'll ask as many as time allows. Next, I want to wel welcome Gretchen Guppy, who is the Policy Director at ACT. Gretchen, could you tell us how the Every Student Succeeds Act aligns to the current work states are doing in accountability and the opportunities that it provides? Sure. So um, can you move to the first slide, please? Um, so Dr. Young did such a wonderful job of, of providing an overview of ESSA or ESSA, as some people are calling it. Um, I won't uh, be redundant here, but um, just to sort of visit, I think, what, what she was talking about. Um, Standards, uh, states must still uh, determine their own challenging set of standards. Um, you must, they must test in grades three through um, eight, once in high school. Um, the assessments must be aligned to the state academic standards, and the results must be disaggregated by subgroups, um, allow for meaningful differentiation in school performance, and um, measure 95% of all students um, in a particular subgroup. I think one thing that um, is key, though, to this conversation is, um, the, converse, or is the requirement of um, assessment peer review, which is not um, embedded into ESSA, but um, is certainly something that states will have to pass um, and submit um, either this, uh, this spring uh, or summer or in the upcoming fall. And I'll talk more about that um, in just a minute. Um, also, as Dr. Young mentioned, states are still responsible for ensuring their students, um, the lowest performing students, are, um, are being served um, in addition to uh, intervening in schools with low graduation rates and um, struggling uh, schools and districts with low subgroup performance. 
And also, um, as mentioned, um, states do have an opportunity um, to, in addition to tracking student performance based on assessments, English language proficiency, um, potentially with growth and um, or achievement, um, they may also include a behavioral or non-academic indicator. Um, so also, as Dr. Young mentioned, full implementation will take effect at the start of the 2017-18 school year. And the um, rulemaking committee is currently um, working on the regulations um, that will guide the implementation of ESSA. Um, they met last week, and they will meet again next week um, to really hammer out some of the some of the specifics. So moving on to the next slide, I think is where um, I can probably provide a little more depth um, with regard to how states can. Um, select or use their assessment system. So like we already mentioned, states still have to test and have a statewide assessment system, but there's a little more flexibility in how they go about doing that um, or how LEAs go about doing that. So the first one here um, is that LEAs, the districts have an opportunity to um, trade out their statewide assessment system if they so choose. Um, and uh, replace it with a nationally recognized assessment like the ACT or the SAT. Now, this would need to be approved by the state, but this is um, this is an option for states um, or option for LEAs who who would like to who would like to do that. Um, also, an opportunity along the assessment front um, are um, the state-led assessment innovations. So states can apply for funding to experiment with innovative forms of assessment. Um, including competency-based, performance-based, interim, cumulative, year-end, computer-adaptive. A whole host of innovative um, opportunities are available and I think really incentivized through ESSA. Um, like I mentioned before, measuring behavioral indicators for student success. I think there's a lot of opportunity for states to explore different measures or incorporate different measures into their accountability systems that um, weren't yet available before. Um, and finally, um, there's also a provision in ESSA that allows for um, interim assessments to be used to produce a summative result. Um, this, I think, will be really interesting to see what states choose to exercise this option if they do um, and how that um, will be reviewed um, and evaluated in a in an assessment peer review process like the one that states are currently undergoing. So that takes me to the final slide here, um, which is just to say, um, again, that yes, states have um, an opportunity to select whatever uh, system they want. Many of you probably have heard of PARC or Smarter Balance or ACT Aspire um, or a host of other statewide assessments that are available. Um, most of those states um, are in full operation um, with their systems. Uh, for those states that are transitioning to a new test, uh, they will not need to undergo the peer review process this year, but they will need to do that moving forward. Um, so for example, uh, we have the state of Wyoming who is using the ACT for um, statewide accountability at the high school level. So we have supported them in their submission um, to the department. And basically what that means is we've addressed um, numbers one through six on this list uh, to help support um, uh, their efforts to pass peer review and show that they meet all the criteria that's listed here. And I think the most important one and the one that's the most talked about right now is the assessments aligned to their state standards. So this is something that's new in peer review. Um, the previous peer review process was suspended, I believe, in December 2012. Um, and now states are on the hook for showing that their assessment systems are actually aligned to, um, to their standards. Um, we're also supporting Kentucky um, with um, their quality course submission um, that they're using uh, in elementary and high school. Or I'm sorry, they're, they're using just in high school. Um, and then we're also supporting Alabama in um, their submission of ACT Aspire in grades three through eight in high school. And then also uh, the state South Carolina and Mississippi and Wisconsin are using the ACT for accountability at the high school level 
um, the, and submitting their, uh, their drafts uh, in the spring, or I'm sorry, in the summer, in June. Um, so that's sort of a high level um, dump, <laughs> if you will, but I'm happy to answer more questions at the, at the, um, at the tail end of this presentation. I um, could talk for a long time about assessments. Uh, but hopefully that gives you some perspective on um, the work that we're doing and also opportunities uh, for assessment and assessment development under ESSA. Gretchen, thank you. Um, if anybody has a question, a question for Gretchen, you can enter it in the GoToWebinar interface, and we will have those uh, all together at the uh, end of our presentation. Now I want to introduce our final speaker, Brennan McMahon-Parton. She's the Associate Director of State Policy and Advocacy at the Data Quality Campaign. Brennan, could you give us your thoughts on the Every Student Succeeds Act means for data policy and accountability and what you see as the state trends in data collection, use, and accountability measures? Absolutely, and thank you so much, um, Elizabeth, for having me on and attendees for tuning in. Um, I, all of us are spending a lot of time thinking and talking about what we call ESSA in our office, um, so exciting to be here and share with you. Um, and I think Gretchen just a second ago said the word opportunity. This is an opportunity for states, and I think that's the really big theme for us, that you know, there's lots of details. There's more than a thousand pages of this law, but what it really represents is an opportunity to really do what's best for kids, what's best for teachers, what's best for families in their state. Um, so if you'll go on to my first slide, just as a little bit of background, and I, I know you've heard a lot already, but from our perspective at Data Quality Campaign, states have been using data for accountability and for transparency for a long time. Um, before No Child Left Behind, though, that certainly formalized it in a lot of ways. Um, and we think that using data to eliminate what's wor illuminate, excuse me, what's working for students and what isn't is really the legacy of No Child Left Behind. Um, there was a lot that got cumbersome and I mean, maybe that we didn't like, but understanding how students in different schools fare compared to their peers was an important thing that came out of that. And so while ESSA or ESSA does represent a shift in the nation's approach to education, it is consistent with that affirmation that data matter to students. Um, and really, the, if you look at this law, regardless if you think of it as a whole lot has changed or maybe it's just a few things have changed, what this is is an opportunity to hit the reset button on the conversation in your state with families and educators. Um, you don't, it's an opportunity to really bring people to the table and say, let's think about this together, about what we really think student success looks like in our state. Um, and if you'll go to my next slide, there's three top top things that we think are, that states need to be thinking about right now. You saw in Lou's presentation that the timeline is, is relatively generous in this bill. Um, you have some time to be really thoughtful and planful. And during this time, we think that first, uh, this is really an opportunity if, if you'll, to use data in different ways. I think so much of the pushback and the concern that we've been hearing from parents and educators, particularly in the past couple of years, is because it felt like those tests and the accountability for those tests in math and reading were all that mattered in education anymore. And while we're still going to have accountability, this, this law, it represents an opportunity for states to think about, here's what we want to be accountable to, here's what we want to be transparent about that may be a broader set of indicators, and here's what we want to give back to schools for them to use for continuous improvement, for really getting better for kids that maybe don't belong in our accountability system. Um, Second is that we think this is a really important time to be getting your data house in order. If you want to just hit the button, you, you've got to meet your data system where it is. And Elizabeth asked at the top, you know, what are the trends in data collection? We're finding that you know most states, uh, pretty much every state at this point, has a, a robust longitudinal data system in place. They have collection processes. They have most of the data that's required in the new law. <clears throat> But a lot of state education leaders, and particularly those who are new, may not realize what all is in there and what they can really do with it. Um, so this is a great time to, like I said, meet your data system where it is, take a step back and understand what you already have, and understand maybe what you're going to need 
um, to implement the new law effectively. And we think there's probably a spectrum, even though all states do have these systems, there's a spectrum of some states who feel like, hey, this is just turning on some new flags versus some other states who are thinking about, wow, we have some new data to collect. <clears throat> and third, we really think this is a time for you to engage stakeholders and plan thoughtfully. Stakeholder engagement is required in the new law, and that was really Congress sending a message saying, go out to your communities and talk together about what's important to you. And so this law represents not only that we're saying it's not top down from the feds to the states anymore, but that it's not only top down from states out to communities, and that's an opportunity to work together um, to, to, to hear from parents, from teachers, from students themselves about what they want to be measured on. Um, and I, a couple of, um, one caveat to that is I think it'd be really exciting to go across the state and do listening tours, and that's absolutely critical. But really high quality stakeholder engagement is not only listening, but reflecting back to people what you've heard and how it influenced the decisions that you made. So on the next slide, I do want to quickly, I know uh, this is going to get redundant, but you'll really know it at the end. I want to go through uh, what the, the so-called five indicators are that are required under ESSA. And you could just go ahead and tick through all five and just get them up on the slide since we've seen them before. As we know, it's math and ELA testing. It's that really important cohort graduation rate in high school, which to us the data quality campaign is exciting because it is the first time a longitudinal statistic has been a required part of an accountability system. So um, we're glad to see we're putting those longitudinal data systems to work. Um, an additional academic indicator, such as student growth. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that later. It's explicitly called out in the law. Um, we think it's a pretty important measure of student success. Progress towards um, English proficiency. And finally, this, this so-called fifth indicator that's going to garner a lot of discussion over the coming months and probably years is an additional non-academic indicator considered to be important to the community. You heard Lou at the top talk about the different things that are called out in this law. It's an opportunity to be really thoughtful about how do we round out that picture of student school success. There's one thing um, that we think is something to consider, and I'm seeing it says absence on my slide, but what I mean is chronic absence. Um, this is a, an indicator that we think states already have the data for, and it really is revealing of a lot of different issues that may be going on in your school, like health, transportation, bullying, that holistic picture can be a leading indicator for. So certainly not the only option, um, but one to consider. One caveat that I'd like to, actually two caveats, that I'd like to put on top of um, these five accountability indicators is we think that this is an opportunity and ESSA to start with the flashlight and not with the hammer. Like I said a minute ago, so much of the concern and, and angst about NCLB was that it was all about those tests and it was all about account accountability to those tests. You have a chance now to go out to your communities and say, what do we care about as a state? You know, the feds listen. They're saying, go out and figure out what's this holistic picture of students and schools in our state. Think about that full picture, all the things you may want to be transparent about first. And then you can go back on top and say, here are the things that we want to wait. Here are the things that we want to create accountability for. Obviously, you have some required parameters, but there is some flexibility about what's included and how you want to weight it. And the other thing that I'll caution is that you can't give districts and schools too many needles to move at once. So while you might hear from the community, from your state audiences, that 20 things are really important to understanding student and school success, that doesn't really give district and school leaders clear, achievable benchmarks to get to. So really thinking narrow, what's clear and achievable for accountability, but broad for transparency and continuous improvement we think is going to be important. So going on to the next slide, one, an opportunity that we are really excited about at TQC and that we're going to be both calling for and supporting states in doing um, is high quality public reports. So you've been required to get this information out there online, AYP, Safe Harbor, you know, most of those report cards, bless your heart states, are hard even for graduate students to dig into and understand. This is such a chance to make information that you put out to the public accessible, realistic in a 2016 internet environment, to, to publish it in the multiple languages that may be spoken in your states. Um, to, and like I said, to think about how you create a broader transparency picture while also including that more tailored set of accountability measures on these reports. And the good news is that there is some money for this. In ESSA, there are grants. 
um, in the assessment grants, there is a, a subset of that that's about investing in high quality public reports, which is great. So you don't have to go it alone. Um, and if you're looking for some inspiration on who's done a really nice job with public reports, we're, we're really pleased with the work that was done in Illinois as well as in Ohio. Not only do they have some pretty nice looking report cards, but they also did a lot of work, like I said, engaging their stakeholders, engaging with school leaders, with educators, with families to understand what they need. Um, going on to the, the next slide, not only is this an opportunity to <clears throat> excuse me, create high quality public reports, but there are a few new things that you're going to be needing to disaggregate and measure and reporting back out to, to your state. So just a few highlights. There, there's a, a new requirement around what I'll call mobile students. So tracking uh, and report how a homeless student, students in foster care, and military connected students are doing academically. Um, USAID is also directed to help interested states disaggregate data on Asian American Pacific Islander students. So that might not be a, a huge population in every state, but for those who want to think about that and want to disaggregate that information to, a, to new sub-levels, um, the department ha can, will provide assistance for that. And finally, ESSA requires that states publicly report data that is cross-tabulated by, at a minimum, each major race, racial and ethnic group, gender, English proficiency status, and disability status. So while we already have these great breakdowns across race, gender, socioeconomic status, now they're asking states to be able to call it information about you know, African American girls or low SES um, Asian American Pacific Islanders, for instance. Um, one caution, of course, is that states will need to be very thoughtful about student privacy and confidentiality in this cell size suppression, those kinds of things. Um, and again, you can look to PTAC, the Privacy Technical Assistance Center, to help you think through as you, as you implement that. Going on to the next slide, in addition to the new disaggregations, there's also some new measures. The first one is that ESSA requires states to calculate and report indicators of post-secondary enrollment, quote, where available. At DQC, because of our work with states and our annual survey of states, we know that at least 39 states are already able to collect and report this information. So we're really going to be looking for pretty much every state to be making this valuable indicator available to parents and the community. And there's an opportunity here to go further to think about not only enrollment, but success. What's retention like? What's your graduation like? What's your mediation like? Those are, that's great information for parents, but also school leaders who are thinking about continuous improvement in their school. They also must, states also must include per pupil expenditures by the funding source. So what came from state, what came from federal, what came from local. Um, I suggest waiting for the guidance on this. <laughs> um, this is a place where that whole meet your data system where it is thing I think is going to be important. And your um, states are also going to have to include actual personnel expenditures for your school, not just averages. You can imagine a couple of different ways that these, these new per pupil expenditure numbers are going to be really impactful when, for instance, parents who kids are in a school who, that has more younger and experienced and therefore lower paid teachers is seeing that their school is getting funded at half the level of the nearby school because they have older, more expensive teachers. It could really change the conversation. Another sort of continuous improvement way to look at it is you can imagine school leaders looking at their, their expenditures and their student performance side by side with another school that has similar expenditure levels, but maybe is doing a little better, and taking that opportunity to collaborate and learn how they're using their, how they could be using their resources differently. That is my big hope for this one, <laughs> that we'll see some great collaboration. Moving on, I want to be mindful, I'm, I'm going to end up getting my five minute warning. Um, HQT, the famed or infamous maybe HQT, is gone, and this is an opportunity um, for states to think about what does, what do we want the community to know, what do we want parents and school leaders to know about what high quality teaching looks like in this state. Uh, one thing that we think is really important to consider is, do your teachers know how to use data? You know, data is clearly the legacy of this law. We have more and better information out there about how students are performing that we can use to personalize student learning. How can we make sure that our teachers in our classroom are data literate and know how to use that information? The good, uh, and, and good news to this, if that feels like a daunting task, is that the Title II funds in um, ESSA now can be used to provide data literacy training to teachers as well as um, privacy training to teachers, so both that ethical and effective use. Um, I 
only have three more slides, I promise. <laughs> so next, on the next slide, I just want to provide a super quick caution that one of the um, one of the provisions in the new law allows for locally selected, nationally recognized assessments. So a high school in your state may say, hey, you know, the state test is fine, but we're interested in using ACT or SAT or even PARC if you're not a PARC state instead. And you're going to end up with different data that's not an apples to apples comparison. So just providing that context when you're reporting this data, helping parents understand why it's different and how they should make decisions based on it. And finally, I just want to call that we think um, student growth models really still matter and, they, and that though we've stepped back off of waivers and those type of requirements that it's still an opportunity to provide this information back to parents and teachers. The conversation about growth has been so mired in teacher accountability, but when we do our parent focus groups and polling at TQC, we know that parents, they don't use that exact word, but their students' progress and their, their potential, that's what they ask for. They want to know. And again, there is money set aside in the SSA um, to help states develop and or improve on the measures of student growth based on assessments. Um, so we, we say don't run away from them. It's still an important indicator. And on the last slide, I just wanted to reiterate you know, the top key in indicators. It's an opportunity to use data in different ways. Um, spend time now getting your data house in order. And finally, really engage your stakeholders and plan thoughtfully in this interim time. Thank you so much. That was whirlwind. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think that we couldn't have had a better panel of speakers. Thank you, Brennan. And thanks again to, to everyone uh, who presented, uh, Lou and Gretchen. Um, we have just a few minutes for questions. Um, again, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the GoToWebinar webinar interface. Um, and just to start, uh, Gretchen, could you tell us more about the peer review systems for state accountability um, and what you're seeing and, and what's going on? Right, so like I mentioned earlier, the peer review process, the assessment peer review process was suspended in December 2012 and that was to allow states to adopt and really implement their statewide standards. As you know, most states um, implemented either the Common Core or other college and career ready standards at that time. And so it didn't make sense to um, review those assessments until um, states had had an opportunity to get those standards in place and then select assessments that would actually measure um, how well students are, are meeting those standards. Um, so it was suspended. States adopted different assessment systems. Um, and in the meantime, the department put out a call for recommendations around what are the types of criteria, what are the things that should be evaluated in an assessment system um, in order to um, really provide the kind of rich information that we want to get out of those assessment systems. Um, so that uh, criteria was issued last December, um, and or I'm sorry, last September. And since then, states have been able to decide when they are going to submit um, their, their, their test for, for a peer review. And that's a panel of reviewers that actually look through, sit down and look through all of the evidence that would support um, things like the design and development of the test, um, whether or not the items are on the test are actually um, measuring uh, critical thinking, for example, or um, anything related to test administration and monitoring security, data security, um, and like I mentioned, the alignment to the standards is a huge, or the assessment alignment to the standards is a huge, huge piece of that. So states have either um, selected to submit in April. I believe there were a round of states that actually submitted during that time, including Wyoming, um, which we helped support. Um, and then also the rest of the states would have to submit um, in June. Um, so our role um, in this has been to support those states that are using ACT solutions. So it's really um, been a partnership with those states to help collect the evidence and the content that they would need to provide a submission that would actually um, allow them to, quote, pass peer review. No, thank you, Gretchen. Um, we had another question come in on what are some of the examples of flexibility that the uh, new Every Student Succeeds Act provides. 
Lou, could you talk about some of the examples of uh, the ways that flight states now have more flexibility than they did with No Child Left Behind? Sure. A couple of them, just to reiterate, will be in the development of the actual accountability system and in the selection of the assessments at the state level. And um, those will go forward in each state's uh, accountability workbook as it moves forward. And you saw a couple of places there where it said or. Um, there are several pilot options, um, not just the ones I mentioned, but um, some that um, Gretchen mentioned as well, to give um, schools and districts some um, uh, opportunity to, for example, the flexibility that would come in funding if, um, if those 50 pilot districts were allowed to commingle state, federal, and local dollars to target um, special supports for students of poverty and students with disabilities. That's got a ton of potential flexibility there as well. The metrics themselves um, are less top-down uh, and more um, organic in nature in that um, how to determine what used to be annual measurable objective. Um, that has been taken off the top. Um, and we're required to report the performance of subgroup populations that we've talked about today, but that annual measurable, measurable objective um, hammer has been removed, for example. Those are the first ones that come to mind. I'm looking at, through a couple of notes here. Um, we were hoping for some flexibility and maintenance of fiscal effort. That didn't happen. A couple others like that. Um, but those are some examples, I think, of, of things that happen. And then just the whole kind of opportunity to, to rethink the assessment systems, rethink public reporting, the use of data, some of the things that we've talked about today, I think um, that people are just really um, welcoming that chance to um, start over. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lou. Um, we've got another question that just came in. Um, can anyone speak to the funding processes under the Every Student Succeeds Act? Has the Department of Education put out any guidance on how much money and how it will flow to school districts and states? So um, if, if that, maybe Lou, I know you just spoke, but I know that you covered sort of the, the flexibility, but if you could talk about how the funding streams have changed and, um, and how they're now allocated. I know you mentioned the block grant. Yeah, I think that a lot of this will, will become more clear as the regulatory process unfolds. Um, a couple of things, there was some concern on the front end that perhaps the model that was raised to the top would make funding out to states more of a competitive rather than formula approach to funding and um, ESSA has been reauthorized with the formula model in mind. So um, state and local education leaders are, uh, are pleased about that um, becoming still relying on the formula as opposed to pitting states and school districts against one another in a more competitive grant kind of a way. Um, the moving title, the English language learners and that um, all of that work um, more into Title I will cause some changes to federal funding to both states and um, districts as that flows trickles down. And the block grants uh, represent some new funding there. Of course, this, this grant does not reauthorize other things like IDEA and the Carl Perkins funds, that kind of thing. But in terms of Title I, Title II, and Title III, we're starting to get some glimpse of support for that through um, both the block grants and uh, what used to be the I-3 process. Frankly, we don't know a lot of details yet, but don't anticipate any real dramatic shifts in the approach to funding um, through ESSA. Um, and, and from what I've seen so far, I've, I've, I think that that's been really positive. For those of you who are in more rural states, I do see a note here that, um, um, that the rural education uh, consolidated application grants are in, for example. So a lot of things that are similar in that way. Um, funding caps here, there's room for small increases in the years uh, from authorization forward. Uh, this authorization exists for four years, but you know under ESEA that authorization was delayed by almost a decade. So um, those are just some highlights that I'm able to see from the notes here. Everybody's waiting to see how that all unfolds. No, no, thank you. Um, Brennan, we've got a question on the um, 39 states you mentioned that report out on post-secondary enrollment. Um, is there a broad spectrum of what 
states are reporting in regards to that data and how it is used. Um, are they doing high school feedback reports? What are some of the examples that come to mind that, of states that are finding success using that data? Yes. So yes, high school feedback reports is usually the home for that. Um, and I that's a perfect opportunity to use as a call for states to think about instead of having all these one-off reports helping people understand the pipeline of education and even workforce success sort of in a one-stop shop. Um, one state that we love to highlight, um, their high school feedback report is actually Kentucky. Um, we think that they have done really great work in, in getting that out into the hands of school leaders and, and helping them inform decision making. Uh, and just as an aside, Kentucky also has a pre-K feedback report, so they, they really focus on this pipeline of success in the state, which we think is really great. And you can, um, there's a full analysis of this on DQC's website, um, so if you search data quality campaign high school feedback report, you can find more details about what states are doing. Brennan, thank you. Um, and then we've got one last question. Uh, we had a couple more, but this will be our last one. Um, how will states uh, meet the Every Student Succeeds standards when um, there are laws in place allowing parents to opt out of uh, state assessment testing? Is that for me? Um, um, please, thank you, Brennan. Yeah. Um, this is a great question. I think um, it causes a lot of people concern. Um, not only are their state opt out, but they sort of spoke both sides of their mouth in the law and said, you've got to meet my 95%, but then you've also got to have a plan for opt out. Um, this is why the stakeholder engagement and getting buy-in from the community that I talked about at the top is so, so, so important. I also think the more states can think about um, testing timelines and the timeliness and the usefulness and how they get those, especially summative assessments, back into the hands of parents. Um, the more states can demonstrate that they're using the assessment audit, or parents, states can demonstrate that they're using the assessment audit grants that are allocated in ESSA to show that they're being thoughtful about which are the most useful assessments and not taking up, you know, all these days that parents get concerned about. Um, the better you'll do because so much of the opt-out is about people don't understand what's in this for me. Um, and this is, like I said, the opportunity to hit the reset button and help people see what's in it for them. Brennan, thank you. And I think that's all the time that we have for today, but I think that we couldn't have had a better uh, group of panelists, and I thought it was really unique to think about uh, this new act through the lens of data use and accountability. I know that there are a lot of folks talking about it, but I thought this was a really interesting perspective as states are starting to grapple with uh, what this new act means and, and the exciting opportunities that it provides. So thanks to everyone who logged in and joined us today, and be sure to check out the CSG website for information about future Academy webinars on education and other topics. Again, I'm Elizabeth Whitehouse at CSG headquarters. Thank you.